Thanks again, Chris. Yeah. It's a neoadjuvant nanomedicine for vascular normalization. And um, I'll show you part of the original slides. I'll go through them very fast. They're very basic. Some of the progress, and then at the end, some of the suggestions on um, how, to, how to apply for these types of grants. I think everybody in this audience, the point is not really working well, knows what nanomedicine are. They're carrier materials. There are many different types of carrier materials. And what they mainly do is they improve the pharmacokinetics and the biodistribution of low molecular weight compounds. There are two let's say, overarching mechanisms for nanomedicine. They, on the one side, protect the drug from the body, so they prevent the drug from going to sites where you do not want to have it, like in heart tissue, as mentioned before, for doxorubicin, and vice versa. They also protect the body from the drug. And what you overall want to do with nanomedicine is it's a two-tailed story. You want to improve efficacy, and you want to reduce toxicity. And I think what we're seeing at the, in the clinic at the moment is that we're mostly reducing toxicity, so we can give drugs in a safer way to patients. Patients experience less or different side effects. But we also want to improve efficacy, and this is really a challenge, I think, in particular for the clinic. Would it be possible to get another pointer? I think this one is. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. I'll try to work with this. Okay, so the problem is that nanomedicine, I think, are not magic bullets. Many people believe that, but they're really not. What you also often get is that preclinically nanomedicine, they work always very well. You get extremely good tumor targeting, as shown in this example here. You can prolong survival using nanomedicine formulations in many different tumor models. But clinically, they generally fail to improve efficacy. So if you look at the survival, this is one of the best curves that you can get for liposomal doxorubicin. They do split up at later time points. But the overall efficiency and, and, and targeting ability of these constructs is fairly low, and it really varies. So EPR, enhanced permeability and retention, is a very variable phenomenon. And this lowering of the toxicity is actually the basis for the EMA and the FDA approval. So at the similar levels of efficacy, but at lower toxicity, you can... Um, you can basically create a basis for the approval of these formulations. So one of the solutions that I proposed at that time is that instead of making ever more nanomedicine formulations, instead of you know, making new drug delivery systems, we should think and really try to come up with concepts to make them work better. And there are many different ways how you can do that. You can integrate them in combinations. You can use imaging. You can integrate them in combinations, as I said before, combinations with radio chemotherapy or, or um, multiple chemotherapeutics within the same formulation. And this, in our case, we, we took resistant animal models and we got fairly good efficacy and fairly acceptable toxicity for these combination treatments. And one of the things that I then came up with actually is this concept called Neo-Nano, which is nanomedicine for um, vascular normalization. This concept was, was proposed by Rakesh Jain and colleagues in the early 2000s. Thank you very much. hope that's better. Okay. Um, and the idea what we wanted to do here is not to develop, let's say, drug delivery systems themselves, but to come up with indirect ways to improve drug delivery. So we take nanoparticles, nanomedicine, and use them to target anti-inflammatory agents to, um, to macrophages in tumors, as you'll see in the next slide. And here the idea is that we normalize and homogenize the tumor vasculature, which normally it's a very chaotic structure, so there are many blood vessels in tumors, but they go in all directions, right? They're not nicely homogeneously distributed. They're not very well perfused. And if we can homogenize and normalize this to make it a, look a little bit more like a vascular network in a tumor, we might indirectly improve drug delivery. We might get drugs to more places in tumors. We might get deeper penetration out of the blood vessels into the tumor interstitium. And we might, for instance, also get more oxygen into the tumors to, um, to improve radiotherapy. So the rationale, it's basically fourfolded. The rationale is that inflammation is a hallmark of cancer. It was at some point recognized as a seventh hallmark of cancer. Now it's embedded within sort of ten hallmarks of cancer. Tumor-associated inflammation strongly induces angiogenesis. That's a well-known fact. Tumor-associated macrophages are the main target cell population for nanomedicine. So people often don't realize, I think, but if you inject nanomedicine and you look in the tumor, so if you co-stain, for instance, liposomes with macrophages, there is a very strong overlap. So most of your nanomedicine material will be in macrophages in tumors. And if we then try to do something with these macrophages to repolarize them, to become less pro-angiogenic, we might be able to normalize... Um, to normalize the vasculature in tumors and to thereby indirectly improve drug delivery. So the idea was to prime the tumor vasculature, so to say, for subsequent treatment with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. We want to target optimal doses of corticosteroid containing nanomedicine to tumor-associated macrophages. Corticosteroids were chosen as some sort of a model drug because cooperators in Utrecht already showed that you can target macrophages and you can sort of repolarize macrophages to become less angiogenic. 
We want to repolarize them, homogenize the vasculature, increase perfusion in tumors and lower the interstitial fluid pressure, and thereby improve drug accumulation, penetration, and tumor oxygenation as a basis to improve the efficacy of combined modality therapy. Also, this pointer is not working anymore. Um, this is the project structure. I won't detail it a lot. It's subdivided basically in two overall phases. Work package one on the left, which is on visualizing and optimizing um, um, nanomedicine-mediated normalization. And in years three to five, or at the moment in year one and a half, I don't know, I think she took the other one. There we really want to go for these combination treatments. So we pre-treat with an anti-inflammatory nanomedicine. Then we come with standard chemotherapy afterwards or with radiotherapy afterwards to improve the uh, outcome of these combination treatments. So normally in an ERC presentation, you, you show some proof of principle. So some of the first experiments you did or some of your old stuff. I'll show you some of the progress we made so far. In particular, visualizing and quantifying nanomedicine-mediated drug targeting. We do this a lot via optical imaging because it's easy, but it also has a lot of shortcomings. So what we did is we came up with a hybrid approach, hybrid CT-FMT, a combination of computer tomography and fluorescence-mediated tomography to improve optical imaging of nanomedicine by distribution. One of the things we did is just fuse these techniques. So we basically we, we combine the anatomical information we can get from CT. As you can see on the right, there you can identify the tumor in green and the kidneys is in, is in yellow, the liver is in red. We combine that, we fuse that with the optical imaging information we get with, with uh, using um, 3D FMT. So if you don't fuse, you get these images, which is the, like the second one from the right, where you actually have no real clue where in the body your formulation is. And if we fuse these images on the basis of CT, we can much more accurately, let's say, um, allocate where the optical probe or the nanomedicine formulation goes in vivo. We actually also really improve the allocation and the, the, the quantification of these probes. This is a really nice example using a construct called Osteosense. It's a low molecular weight bone-specific contrast agent. Immediately after injection, it's very small. It goes to the bladder. And if you just use the standard optical imaging tools, the image, and, and then fuse it with CT, the image you get is shown here on the left, where the bladder is actually, and it's really a pity this pointer's not working, the bladder is between the three points in the middle. But the machine tells us that the probe is, you know, it's surrounding the bladder and it's even outside of the mouse, which is, of course, really strange. So what you can then do is use a shape-based or a so-called volumetric reconstruction in which you tell the optical imaging device that this is the shape of the mouse, right? This is the shape of the mouse. And then it reconstructs, it re-reconstructs the optical information, and then the probe ends up being in the, in, the, in the bladder, which I think is very useful if you're interested in quantitative biodistribution monitoring of uh, drug delivery systems. We actually also, at, at the moment, uh, Felix Remza, who partially is working on this ERC project, he also came up with a shape and absorption-based reconstruction in which we do an absorption pre-scan. So in light, you, when you do optical imaging, you lose a lot of light because of hemoglobin in tissues. If you look at the reconstructed image, the big signal on the top is the liver. The one on the left is the non-reconstructed image, so to say. We basically tell the machine that there is a lot of light going lost in the... You have a better pointer? Oh, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Yes, perfect. Um, so this is the normal situation. Without any reconstruction, the probe is even outside of the body again, but also in the liver, there is not a lot of signal. And that's simply because a lot of light is getting lost in the hemoglobin in the liver, as it's a highly perfused organ. So we do a reconstruction based on the shape and the absorption. And then we actually get like, a much more accurate and, and realistic um, depiction of the situation in vivo. Another thing, of course, nanomedicine-based normalization. So we have to look at tumor blood vessels. We have to look at tumor angiogenesis. We did a comparison in four different tumor models. We took A431, Kalu, MLS, and A549 tumors, which grow with different types of kinetics. They have a completely different, let's say, vascular shape. Some of them have a lot of vessels. Some don't have a lot of vessels. Some have a lot of well-differentiated vessel, uh, vessels, and particularly the, the slowing, growing ones have better blood vessels, so to say. And we look how vascular structures look in these tumors, because this is what we try to normalize. So we need means to visualize these blood vessels. If you look at the rapidly growing tumors, this is in vivo CT imaging, this is ex vivo CT imaging. What you see in rapidly growing tumors is that there are a couple of large blood vessels in the periphery, and then in the middle you have many small sprouts. And probably these sprouts are, they might be fairly leaky, but they're not well perfused, and they're difficult to reach for drug delivery systems. If you go to the more slowly growing tumors, you see that they have a much better differentiated network. There are more vascular branches. They look more, let's say, like vasculature in a healthy tissue. So we're basically trying, basically trying to do is to go from these types of tumors via some sort of an intermediate stage to these types of tumors to reach more sites within the tumor using both standard drugs, actually, and also nanomedicine-based drugs. 
Um, I'll skip this slide for the purpose of time. One of the other things that we showed also is that there's a good correlation between tumor vascularization and drug targeting. So if you combine contrast-enhanced ultrasound imaging with this optical imaging technique I showed you before, one of the studies we did is that we showed that in different tumors, so this is a poorly perfused tumor, here the individual dots are micro-bubbles which report on perfusion of these tumors. This is a poorly perfused tumor, this is intermediate, and this is a highly perfused tumor. If you directly correlate that with optical imaging of drug targeting, you see, and it's, this, to us this seems very logical, that the more efficiently a tumor is perfused, the better the drug is actually going to the tumor. And this is basically the situation we're trying to create. We want to prime the tumor vasculature for treatment with drugs and drug delivery systems. So in, I won't discuss this slide, I'll just say that in, in these, Crit also mentioned that you need to say something about yourself in these projects, right? You need to show why your background is good to do such a project, how your environment, your institution fits to the broader scope of this project. You need to say what you want to do after such projects or in addition to these projects. And what I really would like to do is to do combination treatments using nanomedicine. I think cancer needs to be treated with combinations. Um, another thing is what we really want to do is we want to look at tumor metastasis. Patients don't die of a solid tumor, they die of metastasis. So we want to use nanomedicine, nanomedicine-based combination treatments to target metastasis. You can do this with classical chemotherapeutics but also with anti-inflammatory nanomedicine. And we're also working with these anti-inflammatory nanomedicine via several collaborator, uh, collaborators in arthritis, in atherosclerosis, in fibrosis. And the other thing is, I really want to combine drug targeting and imaging, because I think it really makes a lot of sense. If we can personalize treatments, we can much more efficiently treat patients. If we can pick out the patients that have good EPR, that have good accumulation, we can likely pick out the patients that will respond in the end. And vice versa, if you already know, after, let's say, day one, we administer an image-guided nanomedicine probe, we look at a heterogeneous patient population, we can identify patients without EPR, you can treat them with a different drug from day two onwards. So you're really personalizing treatments, so to say. Okay, I put up a whole list of suggestions in the hope that we have a lot of young people in the audience that consider applying for this. I don't see too many young people. I see a lot of middle-aged, still good-looking people, though, but, so I'm not sure how relevant this slide is. But what I think is important is you have to tackle a real problem, and you have to tackle a relevant problem in a realistic manner. Sometimes we were talking about miraculous results this morning in another session. I think you really see that too often, and if we really want to move this field forward, the miraculous nanomedicine field, we have to do this in a realistic manner. And I think that's where combinations come in, that's where imaging comes in. You have to do it by an original and a cool and a creative approach. So it really has to be something that really was like, oh wow, this is, this is smart, this is interesting. I think you should always keep clinical translatability and practicality in mind, so you can make a 10-component pharmaceutical formulation which can go from, let's say, the injection site into certain compartments in the cell via 10 different steps, but no pharmaceutical company will be able to upscale this at some point. So the, the, I think the, the end, end of the day dogma would be keep it simple, try to find the least number of components to make something work. And you, you have to keep it authentic. You have to base, base it on your own experience and expertise. You need to convince reviewers that what you're trying to do builds on your knowledge that you obtained before, builds on the experimental techniques that you developed before. And then more on a personal level, like I said before, you have to build on your background. I think it's wise to stick around in a certain field. So people move for postdocs to fantastic labs in the US, but they have to completely switch topics, which you know, can be good, can be bad. I'm not sure. I, I didn't do it, and for me it worked out to just stick around and work with the right people. As Patrick already mentioned, you really have to take your time. You have to think and think again. I think in, in my case, I just wrote parts and I let it lying around for a month and then I read it again or changed some figures. You need to really refine the project. And you need to ask peers and people that already applied for their advice. I think you know, sometimes you might not like the advice if they're like really critical, but in the end of the day, if you get advice from 10 different people, the end result you have will always be better. So do talk to a lot of people that did it before. You have to prepare well, you have to practice your talk, I think, you have to consider contingency plans. Imagine something doesn't work, right? So imagine that, that in a five-step process, the second step doesn't work. If you don't think about that and a reviewer asks it, you're basically out. And you have to be confident, you have to stick to your time, which I didn't, I'm one minute over. You have to carefully answer questions, you have to prepare questions, I would say, because sometimes, especially these interview rounds, you get really tough questions. So think of potential questions, think of potential answers. Um, I think I'll leave you with this slide. I'd just like to thank some of the people that are actually working on this. I thought I circled them, but I didn't. There are three guys that are actually here that work on the project. Of course, I'd like to thank the ERC for the funding, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Please, yes. yes. Very nice talk, thank you.
So uh, my understanding is that uh, when we do vascular normalization, vascular normalization is depends on the dose of the endogenic treatment and the time of the treatment. No. So that it forms this normalization window. And if we're in that, inside this normalization window and provide the chemotherapy or the nanotherapy, we'll see benefits. Yeah. In your research, how do you make sure that you are in this, inside this normalization window? Is there some A very good question. So I took the scheme out because it always takes like a minute to explain. So what are you saying that when you normalize, what people normally do to normalize the vasculature is give moderate dose anti-angiogenic therapy. If you give a too high dose, you're killing the vessels. If you're giving a too low dose, you're not doing anything. So you need to be in an optimal dose, and you also need to do it for an optimal period of time. And then you're in a normalization window, which might be very variable in patients, actually. So I think what we try to do, and what people should be doing if they're doing it in the clinic, is combine imaging. You need some sort of non-invasive MR-based information or CT-based information on what is going on with your vasculature at this moment of time, and then come with your treatment. And I think perfusion is a good, bio, it's a good marker. So if you see improving perfusion, and I like your slide, which show that when perfusion is up, then drug delivery is up, and no. therapeutic outcome goes no. up. So perhaps if someone measures perfusion and combine with during treatment to see what is the optimal point where no. exactly. the drug can be delivered. No. That's the idea. Terry, please. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Rakesh Jain at one time, and that is, when you do the vascular normalization, it's clear from Rakesh's work that you increase the perfusion of small molecule therapeutics. But do you lose the EPR effect? Because in normalizing the vasculature, then you eliminate the larger pores that the nanomedicines pass through. What do you think? Very good question. That was one of the questions I prepared for the discussion, actually, because this question always comes up. Yeah, so almost also asked it when I, or when, I, when I showed him the concept. So the idea here is to take drug delivery systems to normalize, and then we come with a normal drug. So we do not necessarily have to come with a nano drug afterwards. So we want to basically use, let's say, nanocort or one of the liposomal anti-inflammatory formulations first, and then we come with normal doxorubicin. We would never use doxorubicin, but it does not necessarily have to be a nanodrug that comes second. Although, in the ideal case, I would use a nanodrug second, but then a very small one. So I think what, what Rakesh Jain showed in one of the papers that came out after the, the, this project started is that in case of 10 nanometer-sized nano formulations, you increase perfusion, you get better overall accumulation. The permeability for them does not decrease. But if you look at liposomes, then basically because you normalize, you close some of the gaps in a tumor and the liposomes can't get out anymore. And we're actually seeing that as well. So we, we did some very initial studies that I did in the proof of concept phase with polymers. And there we saw an improved accumulation. And then we repeated it with liposomes actually twice. And people in Leiden tried it with liposomes twice. And there it doesn't work anymore. So this is a very, I think it's a very delicate thing, this vascular normalization. I think it's a really cool concept. But I wonder whether it at some point will become really clinically doable, because there's so much variation in, in EPR in general. That's already tough enough. And to hit this normalization window with a certain drug in a certain patient will be, will be fairly difficult. Nonetheless, nonetheless, I think that if you have a compound that gives some potential normalization, they're always suitable for implementation in, in combination treatments. So Avastin is performing really well in combination treatments, maybe because it's partially normalizing the tumor vasculature. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, w while treating uh, the tumor, it's a normalization period. What happens then to the metastasis? So I think it's shown that if you normalize the vasculature, that metastasis decreases. But that's only in preclinical models. If you basically, if you close the tumor blood vessels, it's more difficult for infiltrating or for, let's say, extravasating cancer cells or intravasating cancer cells to leave the vasculature again. So let's say that based on the preclinical data out there, the, the assumption at the moment is that if you normalize the primary tumor, metastasis will go down. Well, but metastasis might be there 10 years before. They just proliferate. I mean, not sure. the new metastasis. No. Yeah. Not, the, not asking about how you prevent the circulating oh, okay. tumor cells. I want to ask what happens while you're shedding drug, whatever kinds of drug, you should affect other physiologies in the body, specifically the yeah. metastasis. What happens there? Good question. Never thought about it. You'll, you'll, I think, personally, I think that... You better think. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, I'll think about it. I'll come back to you afterwards. We have to move on in the interest of time. I'll pass over to uh, Triantafilos Stylianopoulos. I hope I pronounced it correctly. 
We'll be talking yeah. about the mechanical forces 